Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome back once again to our ongoing series on the glories of our most beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nivishesha Shunyavadi Pashtacha Deshatane All glories to Sri Prabhupada. So, we are continuing with our mini-series on Stimulation for Ecstatic Love, and this will be part 53. In this lecture, I would like to speak on the famous Simon Taka Jewel. Simon Taka Jewel. As you may remember, uh, last week we spoke on another jewel, the famous Kastuba Jewel. Actually, I was thinking, Vrindavan is often referred to as Chintamani Dham translates as the, the land of jewels and gems. And Srila Naratam Das Thakur writes in his Partana, in his famous song, uh, Vashanta Rasa, Vrindavan Ramyastana Divya Chintamani Dham, Ratna Mandira Manohara, Avrita Kalindi Nire, Raja Hamsa Keli Kore, Tahi Shobe Kanaka Kamala. Beautiful Vrindavan is filled with Chintamani gems and many jeweled palaces and temples. Many regal swans play in the waters of the Jamuna, and in those splendid waters a golden lotus flower grows. So jewels. And in Vrindavan Mahimamrita, uh, Satika 14, verse 93, Srila Prabhondanda Saraswati describes that the trees of Vrindavan are made of jewels. He writes, May Vrindavan's most delightful and transcendental trees, which are filled with the rays of unlimited blissful moons, which are illuminated by the effulgence of the most precious lapis lazuli, which are covered with the effulgence of sapphires, emeralds, and diamonds, and which appear shining as unlimitedly beautiful golden mirrors, become the objects of my meditation. We thank him. And in Satika 15, uh, verse 51, he writes, <clears throat> The abode of Vrindavan is decorated with many jewel and diamond studded altars. It is beyond the description of millions of the best poets. There are many opulent, transcendental golden mountains in Vrindavan. It is filled with many jewel, clay, mineral, and metal mines, and is beautified by many divine caves. Now, Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, in his Braj Riti Chintamani, verses um, 13 to 17, he writes in a similar way. He writes, In some places the ground of Braj is made of camphor dust. In some places it is saffron. In some places it is made of ground musk. And in some places it is made of the aromatic substances used in religious ceremonies. He goes on, in some places the ground of Braj is made of emeralds, and in other places it is made of a variety of precious gems. In some places the ground of Braj is a golden Jambu river, and in other places it is made of sapphires. In some places the ground of Braj is made of emeralds, and the trees, bushes, and creepers are made of gold. In other places the ground is gold, and the trees or emeralds. In some places the ground of Braj is made of rubies and the trees and vines are crystal. In other places the ground is crystal and the trees and creepers are rubies. <laughs> Chintamani Dham. <laughs> also we explained in a previous lecture, you may remember, that the very dust of Vrindavan is made from the Chintamani stones of Braj. Thus it's described that dust shines day and night. Therefore, we hear that when the ornaments of Radha and Krishna sometimes fall into the dust of Vrindavan while they're performing their rasa dance, it's very difficult to find those ornaments. Therefore, one of the duties of the gopis is to search the sparkling and glittering dust of Braj to find the lost ornaments and return them back to the divine couple. What a wonderful seva. <laughs> So then it comes as no surprise that Krishna himself wears the famous Kastuba jewel, which we spoke about extensively last week. 
And of course, no less famous is the renowned Sayamantaka Jewel, Shamantaka Jewel. Srila Prabhupada, in his Krishna book, uh, dedicates actually an entire chapter, I think it's chapter 56, to the history of the Shamantaka Jewel. And of course, as we stated many times, Krishna book itself is a summary study of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. So today I will speak on Srila Jiva Goswami's commentaries on the portion of Srimad Bhagavatam's description of the Shamantaka Jewel. And also we'll have commentaries by other illustrious acharyas. It's going to be really relishable today. But first of all, it's interesting that the famous uh, Sanskrit dictionary, Amara Kosha, which I often refer to as an authoritative reference, it actually doesn't contain the term or the name of this jewel, Shaimantaka. <laughs> I was really surprised. For that, I had to turn to another uh, ancient Sanskrit dictionary, the Trikanda Shesha Sanskrit dictionary, which says, Mani Shamamtako Hoshte Vishnu, that the Shamantaka is a gem found in Vishnu, Krishna's hand. And further details I found in the Vyatpati Ratnakara commentary <laughs> on a Sanskrit dictionary named Abhidhan Chintamani. This work is uh, actually by a learned scholar from the Jain school of thought. And he says, Vishnu Hastashto Manisi Mantayati Diptibir Dhyam Iti Shamantaka. The gem in Krishna's hand, which divides the sky into two parts by its effulgence, is known as Shamantaka. So there we find some detail. The gem in Krishna's hand, which divides the sky into two parts by its effulgence, is known as Shamantaka. Now that learned scholar, he goes on, he says, in other words, when projected into the sky, the effulgence of the rays of this gem go so high that they appear to divide the sky into two parts. Clarifies even more. So this then is the meaning of the term or the name Shayamantaka. Took some time to find that, <laughs> you can imagine. Now, the origin of this gem in this world uh, is Surya Dev, the sun god. This gem was originally, of course, originally it's Krishna's, but <laughs> I will see later on who owns that gem. But this gem was, uh, in this world, originally owned by Surya Dev, the sun god, who gifted it to his devotee, Satrajit, who lived uh, in Lord Krishna's capital city of Dwarka when Krishna was present 5,000 years ago. So this Satrajit was a great devotee of the sun god. Now, in his commentary, to Srimad Bhagavatam 10.56.3, Srila Sridhar Swami says that even though Surya Dev was the worshipful uh, lord of Satrajit, he would often relate with Satrajit uh, like a friend. And thus one day he gifted the Shamantaka jewel to Satrajit out of affection for him. Gave it to his devotee, this valuable jewel. Now, Srila Jiva Goswami, in his commentary to the same verse of the Bhagavatam, narrates the detailed history exactly how Satrajit got the Simantaka jewel from the sun god, Surya Dev. And I'll share that with you. One day, when Satrajit was performing worship of his Ishta Dev, Surya Dev appeared personally in front of him. But the form of Surya Dev was not clearly visible to Satrajit because of a strong effulgence surrounding or coming from Surya Dev. <laughs> so at that moment, Satrajit said, Oh, my master, you've appeared before me. O oh, Lord of all bright objects in the sky, I am seeing you here, but the, this vision is almost the same as the vision when I see you up in the sky. There's nothing special about this vision of yours, even though I am here as your devotee and your friend. So hearing this, Surya Dev took the Shamantaka gem from his neck and placed it some distance away. So at that moment, Satrajit could see the personal form 
of Surya Dev, not just this effulgence. Like when you look at the sun in the sky, you see this effulgence. So with great joy, Satyajit spoke to Surya Dev for it's described uh, a muhurta. They had a conversation for a muhurta, which is around 48 minutes. Then at one point, I was amazed to read that Satyajit requested Surya Dev as follows. O oh, my most worshipable Lord, kindly gift me the gem which illuminates you and all the worlds. Wow. Kindly gift me the gem which illuminates you and all the worlds. And hearing this request from his devotee, Satrajit, Surya Dev kindly gifted him the Shnaimantaka gem. Now as soon as Satrajit put on this gem, he too started emanating this brilliant effulgence. And it's described that such was that effulgence that when he entered Dwarka, he couldn't be recognized by anyone. Actually, everyone thought that Surya Dev, the sun god, was actually entering Dwarka to meet Krishna. Now, at that time, it's interesting, Krishna was playing a game called Chaushara. Chaushara. I looked it up. This is a board game famous throughout Vedic history. And bets are often placed while playing this game. And actually, the Pandavas lost their kingdom in one such game against Duryodhana and Shakuni. They were playing this game. So as Satrajit entered Dwarka, glowing like the sun, the residents of Dwarka ran to Krishna and they said, O Lord, O lotus eyed Dhamodar, O Govinda, obeisances to you, O Lord, the denizens in heaven constantly seek to have your darshan. And knowing you now to be present in the Yadu dynasty, the sun god is coming here to see you. <laughs> so all-knowing and omnipresent Krishna, he just laughed. And he said, uh, that's not Surya Narayan. That's not the sun god. That's Satrajit, who was glowing because of the gem around his neck. So Srila Jiva Goswami says that although the Kastuba jewel was around Krishna's neck at this time, by the Lord's desire, its effulgence was reduced in comparison to the Simon Taka jewel. Now, <clears throat> when everyone came to know that Satrajit had obtained the Simon Taka jewel from Surya Dev by the power of his devotion, you could say, they all began celebrating. And when Brahmanas arrived, Satrajit gave them the jewel and after worshipping it, they placed it in a secure temple. He actually asked them to do that. He was very attached. So he said, take it to a secure temple, please, after worshipping it. Now, it's interesting. While they're in that temple, each day that gem would produce eight bharas, which is approximately four pounds or 1.9 kilos of gold every day. It would produce, this gem would produce four pounds or almost two kilos of gold. And in time, this gem became even more famous for wherever it was properly worshipped, um, there would be no famine, pestilence, negative uh, planetary influences, mental or physical diseases. I think I covered everything. Now, Srila Jiva Goswami comments that properly worshipped means offering it to Krishna. He says, not offered to Krishna, worship is never proper. And thus the same Shamantaka gem can also generate ill fortune, as we'll see in later pastimes, because it's not properly being worshipped. It has to be worshipped in relationship to Krishna. Now, during all this time, Satrajit, again, considered this powerful gem to be his property and his property alone. However, Lord Krishna in Dwarka felt that this gem and the gold it produced should be used for the welfare of the kingdom of Dwarka. Thus it said, he requested Satrajit many times to give it to Maharaj Ugrishena, who ruled over Dwarka, to use it for the benefit of the general public. Satrajit, however, was very greedy and he wanted to keep it for himself. 
Thus, whenever Krishna would ask for it, Satyajit would say, well, think about it. <laughs> you don't say that to the Lord. I'll think about your request. That's not Amala Bhakti. So he never gave it. So Srila Jiva Goswami says, and I quote here, Krishna requested for the gem in a very logical and just manner, but Satyajit was very selfish, unquote. Now, Srila Vishwanath Chakavati Thakur. We're fortunate. There's many comment, uh, great commentators on this pastime. He also comments at this point in the pastime, saying that even when Krishna doesn't ask for something, one should offer a good thing to him before using it for oneself. Not doing so is a big fault. What then to speak of something that Krishna has personally asked for? And what to speak of something which Krishna has repeatedly asked for. Certainly the faults of Satyajit were glaringly obvious. Nice comment. Now, the Bhagavatam goes on to describe that one day, Prashena, Prashena was the brother of Satyajit. He went and took that jewel and hung it around his neck and went alone for hunting in the forest. He just went to the temple and took it and put it around his neck and went uh, for hunting in the forest. Now here, Srila Jiva Goswami quotes the Vishnu Purana, that because Satrajit did not want to give the gem to Krishna, Prashena uh, hung it around his neck and carelessly went alone for hunting one day. Carelessly went home alone for hunting one day. Unfortunately, it's described it was Prashena's last day on the planet. For instead of him hunting animals, he was killed by a lion that day. I read also the horse of Prashena was also killed by the same lion, but that's just a detail. And while mauling Prashena to death, the lion got hold of the Shaimataka gem and took it inside a cave some distance away. Now the plot thickens. Just as the lion was entering the cave, Jambavan, the famous king of bears, who lived in that cave, killed the lion and took the Shaimataka jewel and gave it to one of his sons, little boy, to play with. <laughs> Srila Sridhar Swami gives the name of that son as Shukumara, Shukumara. So many nice details. Now, when Satrajit in Dwarka found out that his brother, Prashena, and the Shamataka jewel were missing, he was in great anxiety. He had learned that Prashena had taken the gem and hung it around his neck and gone to the forest for hunting, but he didn't know what happened to him. He was also well aware that Krishna had repeatedly asked for the gem <laughs> because Krishna was asking him. So Satyajit, you know, he was thinking, Krishna repeatedly asked me for this gem. So Satyajit did something very dishonest at that time. He created a false rumor that Krishna uh, had his brother killed for wearing the gem. Now some of the citizens of Dwarka, who unfortunately were followers of Satyajit, also started perpetrating this, these, these rumors, false rumors. So when Krishna heard of these rumors, he wanted to clear his name. So he took a few gentlemen from Dwarka and went on a search party to find Prashena in the forest to show that he, he hadn't killed him. <laughs> but in the forest, they actually came across the dead body of Prashena and the horse. However, the bodies had the marks of a lion upon them. So thus it was confirmed, ultimately, that Krishna was not the one who had ordered Prashena killed. He had been killed, but not by Krishna. Now, although this in itself was enough to remove these rumors that Krishna was behind the slaying of Prashena, Srila Jiva Goswami says that Krishna also wanted to give a lesson to Satrajit. Thus he told the search party to trace the footprints of the lion. Let's find the lion. So the search party followed the footsteps of the lion and found that it had, of course, entered into a cave 
But near the cave, they found the dead body of the lion that Jambavan had thrown after killing it. Now, the cave that they had come upon was very deep and dark. They kind of looked in there. And it's interesting, Krishna mercifully asked everyone to stay outside while he personally went in alone, probably to search for that gem. <laughs> so Jiva Goswami says, um, this was the mercy of the Lord on the residents of Dwarka. For, he says, he never put anyone into danger, not even Satrajit or Prashena. Now the plot thickens. Once inside the cave, he saw that the Shaimataka gem was in fact being used as a toy for one of the sons of Jambavan. So Krishna stood in a corner, you know, waiting for an opportunity to trick the child and take the gem back. However, by the arrangement of Lila Shakti, meaning the pastime potency, a female servant of Jambavan, who took care of his children, happened to see this, quote, never before seen effulgent person. It's an interesting way to describe Krishna. This never before seen effulgent person in the cave. So she got frightened and shouted out very loudly, help! Now here it's interesting. The Acharyas explained that her fear was because she didn't know Krishna, not because Krishna's form was frightening. You have to catch that. The Acharyas explained that her fear was because she didn't know who was this Krishna, not because Krishna's form was frightening. And Jiva Goswami, he concludes here. He writes, Krishna's form is most pleasing, but because Krishna was unknown to her, that's why she shouted out. Hare Krishna. So hearing her cry, Jambavan rushed to the spot, but he couldn't understand that this was the same Lord with whom he had built a great bridge to Lanka in Lord Ramachandra's pastimes. So Jambavan started attacking Krishna, said throwing everything he could find at the Lord. And Krishna, he also fought with great strength, and the fight lasted uh, exactly 28 days without a break. So after 28 days of continuous fighting, each and every joint in Jambavan's body had become loosened, that's how it's described. And some joints had actually been broken. And at that point, he finally understood that here was his Lord Ram in a new incarnation. <laughs> so he glorified Krishna, and then Krishna very mercifully placed his hand lovingly on Jambavan's body. And Krishna told him, I, I, I've come into this cave to, for, for the gem, because the gem had caused negative rumors about him, and he wanted to stop those rumors, because Satrajit had used the gem in the wrong way. So remember, it can work both ways. So hearing this, Jambavan happily presented the Shaimataka jewel to Lord Krishna. At the same time, he presented his daughter, Jambavati, to the Lord as a new wife. Now, I was reading, Jambavati was as beautiful as a Gandharva. And it's described, this was because Jambavan himself was the son of Brahma, and he could assume many forms. Thus his daughter was also divine, and thus she had a heavenly form. Very beautiful girl. Srila Jiva Goswami goes on to describe that Jambavan's daughter, Jambavati, was actually born in Treta Yuga <laughs> during Lord Ram's pastimes. And Jambavan had offered her to Lord Ram in marriage. But because Lord Ram had taken a vow to only have one wife, Sita Devi, he couldn't accept Jambavati's hand in marriage. So at that point, back there in Treta Yuga, Jambavan then performed great austerities. And I was so surprised to find out where. At Govardhan Hill, <laughs> at Govardhan Hill. And as a result, he obtained a benediction that the Lord would visit him in the future and marry his daughter. And thus that benediction was finally fulfilled in this pastime of Shaimataka Jewel. <laughs> now, it's also written that the search party <laughs> had waited for the Lord outside the cave for 12 days. And after 12 days, they just gave up reluctantly and returned to Dwarka. 
And when the family members of Krishna, who were many, came to know that he had not come out of the cave for 12 days, they were, how's it described, immersed in waves of sorrow. And they started cursing Satrajit, especially because it had been proven by now that Prashena was killed by a lion. So the residents of Dwarka started praying to their family deities. I thought it was interesting. Namely, Chandra Bhaga, <laughs> a form of Durga, to kindly send back the lord of their lives, Krishna. So Durga Devi blessed them that they will soon have good fortune. Soon have good fortune. That soon was just a few moments because as soon as they got that benediction, Krishna suddenly appeared there along with his new wife, Jambavadi, and he gave the Saimataka jewel to Ugrishnena, finally. And the residents of Dwarka were in bliss. It's written that their life heirs had returned. Their life heirs had returned. Oh, for that day. They were in bliss. Krishna, however, there's lots of twists and turns to this pastime. Krishna, however, wanted to uh, humiliate Satrajit in a proper fashion. Thus, he organized a meeting of all the Yadavas the next day, and in front of many of the residents of Dwarka, he narrated all that had happened in regards to this mystical Shamantaka jewel. Then, to everyone's surprise, he requested Maharaj Ugrasena to give the Saimantaka jewel back to Satrajit. <laughs> I was going like, what? But then I read, the Acharyas say that this was a great dishonor to Satrajit because earlier Krishna had requested Satrajit to give the gem to Ugrasena. But now with the turn of events, Ugrasena was giving the greedy Satrajit the Saimantaka jewel. So it's an embarrassing situation for Satrajit. So greatly embarrassed, he went back home and there he thought of himself now as a very short-sighted, wretched person. So he thought of an idea to rectify himself. He thought, I will give my daughter, Satyabhama, to Krishna in marriage and also the gift of the, the Shaimantaka gem to Krishna in dowry. I'll give him my daughter and I'll give a dowry and the dowry would be the Saimataka jewel. Now, it's not over. Krishna accepted Satyabhama, but refused to accept the Saimataka jewel. He said to Satrajit, this gem is yours now, and I, I will only accept the gold that it produces. So Jiva Goswami says, in other words, the gold will come to the kingdom of Dwarka, and the gem with all its misfortunes, because remember, it can be used properly or improperly, and he used it improperly, will stay with Satrajit. And what happened next is a really amazing. Like when I read it, I went, oh my God. Hare Krishna. But you'll have to wait till next Friday <laughs> when, we, when we recount how this pastime continues to unfold in part two of the Simon Tucker Jewel. Hare Krishna Prabhus. Actually, we have so much information that I realized I had to <laughs> give this lecture in two different parts. Maybe three, I don't know. It's such an amazing pastime. So please bear with me. <laughs> we'll be back in, a w in one week. Um, I wanted to say before concluding that these, the pastimes we've related today are mainly taking place in Dwarka, of course, but next week they'll move up to Vrindavan. So stay tuned. But let us not forget that such pastimes of the Lord as, as we've heard today in Dwarka are also very dear to him. Dwarka is a special place. Dwarkadish, Rukmini. We, 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 of course, stress Braj, Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes, as top most of all, but the pastimes in Dwarka exist because that's Krishna's desire. And variety is the spice of life. So I thought we could finish today with a beautiful verse from uh, Srila Sanatana Goswami's Brihat Bhagavatamrita, wherein uh, Gopa Kumar describes. Dwarka, so sweetly. Very appropriate uh, verse for finishing today. The happiness found in liberation is said to be supreme. 
multiplied many millions of times, it might be said to equal the joy in Vaikuntha. And if any joy still greater can be conceived, it is that which is found in Ayodhya. But the joy born in Dwarka, how can anyone even begin to describe it? But the joy born in Dwarka, how can anyone even begin to describe it? All glories to Dwarka now. All glories to Sri Prabhupada. Thank you. Cliffhanger. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Varashna Mushundar Ki, Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Varavani Ki, Mayapur Dham Ki, Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Shri Krishna Sankirtan Yagya Ki, Nitai Gopimanandi, Jay Jay Sisi Radhe Sharm. Glories to Shiva Falafa. Thank you, my Lord.